I want to briefly touch on the Appeals Committee because that's another of the reports. There is not one shred of evidence that anyone on that Appeals Committee acted with anything other than good faith. Radapov told you they grilled him. Not a rubber stamp. They pressed him hard in those arguments. And Coach McNair admitted that he walked out of that Appeals hearing feeling hopeful, hoping they would rule his way. And unfortunately for him, they didn't. They felt, you heard from Ms. Ollendorf yesterday on the video, that there was sufficient evidence. And there was a credibility call, and it wasn't important to them that they quoted that middle of the night call perfectly. Of course, they didn't even quote it. But that something was said about impermissible benefits during the call. And here's another thing you, another thing going back to that point, that they want to link up Todd McNair with what happened to USC. When this went on appeal, they split the cases up. USC got affirmed in an entirely separate hearing and an entirely separate report by the Appeals Committee. That's how separate they were. And in that USC hearing, Radhoff wasn't even allowed to argue about Todd McNair because the Appeals Committee said, we don't want to hear anything about Todd McNair when it comes to USC because you didn't increase your penalties against USC based on Todd McNair. They're just not linked. That's just not in the evidence that you saw or heard. And you know what else is not in the evidence? They've come up with this suggestion that in December of 2010, let me just frame it for you, in December of 2010, Mr. Emmert makes this statement about the Bush case, they got it right, I think. And that was while the appeal was still pending. And so they say that was a sign to these people that they had to rubber stamp it. Again, no evidence of that. There's not even evidence that any of these people on the appeals committee knew about Mark Emmert's statement. They took Patty Ollendorf's deposition. They didn't even have the guts to ask her whether she even had heard of Mark Emmert's statement. How could it have influenced them if there's no evidence they ever even heard of it? And there's none in the record. So now I want to get to the part of the case that's about causation and damages. Causation. means that whatever Coach McNair is suing about has to be caused by the NCA. <clears throat> and when we got to these last questions, you notice in counsel's presentation, he just zipped right through them. Check, 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 check. Let's look at the evidence. Question six, did Todd McNair suffer harm to his property, business, profession, or occupation with respect to these statements? Now, Folks, if you followed my argument, and if what I'm saying makes sense, and if you agree that Todd McNair can't carry his burden of proof, proof you don't even get the question six. But if you do, what's the evidence of harm? And this is economic harm. This isn't that human harm. This is property, business, profession, or occupation. They have to show that some economic harm happened as a result of the report in order for you to go forward in this verdict. Again, let's look at the evidence. Eleanor Myers wanted Coach McNair to be able to continue to coach. That's what she said. And she's the one who came up with the suggestion for a one-year show cost penalty limited to recruiting. That was her suggestion. I believe it's in Exhibit 22. My memory serves right, and if not, my colleague will correct me. The penalty wasn't Roscoe Howard's suggestion or Shepard Cooper's suggestion. It was the suggestion from the person who took the most care and deliberation to try to be fair to Todd McNair. 
And she told you that they had to do something. They all concluded he lied. They all concluded he knew that there were likely violations. They couldn't just let it go, but they gave him the lightest penalty they could. He's always been allowed to coach. For one year period after his appeal was denied, he couldn't interact with recruits. And that, under his contract, was only 20% of his job. He acknowledged that when I examined him. It's as low as you can go in terms of a penalty. Don't remember ever giving less than that. You know, we had examples, and we asked various people about other coaches and what's happened to them, because they want you to forget the fact that coaches are coming up before this committee all the time. And in high profile cases, too, you know, the way they tell it, this was the biggest case in the history of the NCAA, except maybe the SMU case from the 1980s. The witnesses didn't agree with that. It was high profile. There are high profile cases every year in the NCAA. And sure, when it's USC, it's a bigger deal in LA. When it's Penn State, it's a bigger deal in Happy Valley. But it's always a big deal in the place where the school is. But look at what their own expert said. He reviewed information about coaches who got a one or two year show cause, and he doesn't, couldn't recall a single example of a coach like that who didn't return to coaching. That's their expert. So how are you just gonna jump to the conclusion that this prevented Mr. McNair from coaching again? That's what they're asking you to do, to jump there. And no one, not one witness in this case, has said that a one-year penalty is a career ender. Not even their expert. So again, there's no evidence with which Todd McNair can prove to you that the answer to question six is yes. There's no evidence with which he can win that race. But if we go further in the form, which I don't think we should, Given the evidence, the problems only get worse and worse for him in this case for damages. Because the NCAA's conduct has to be a substantial factor. It can't just be a minor reason for his problems, but a substantial factor in his harm. Conduct is not a substantial factor in causing harm if the same harm would have occurred without that conduct. And here I want to pause and talk about what's not in this report. Todd McNair's name isn't in it. Okay, well, they refer to him as assistant football coach, so I don't want to oversell that point. But did they ever say that he paid Reggie Bush? Of course not. There's no evidence that he paid Reggie Bush. They didn't make that up. Did they say that he was involved in this agency, a part of the deal? funneling money, no. And of course they said nothing, not a word, not a breath about his history with dogs. So if those things are what, if any of those things are causing Coach McNair problems, that people think he paid Bush, or that he was a part of this agency, or his history with dogs, that's just not caused by these statements. It's just not, because it's not in there. And you know, you know, Coach McNair explained it to you himself. What, what is he really upset about? That people come up to him and say, hey coach, you got fired giving Reggie Bush money. <clears throat> There's nothing in any of these reports that says that. First of all, he didn't get fired, his contract expired, but no one on these committees, no NCAA staff member, no one associated with my client ever said that Coach McNair paid Reggie Bush money. So if that's what's causing him harm, it can't have possibly been caused by the NCAA. And respectfully to Coach McNair and to his legal team, they decided on this strategy. The day his appeal was denied in the appellate committee, April 29, 2011, that same day Mr. Thompson told the world that this was the end of 
coach McNair's career. Now, you know, I asked Coach McNair about this, and, and you, you know, you, you did see him get emotional, and I do believe that he misses coach. I wasn't suggesting he was faking that, but I am suggesting that they made a decision to claim this was a career ender, and they made it before there was any possible evidence of that. Let me start with something Dennis Thomas said. This is the way life is. You keep looking for a job until you get a job. I don't think that's something that I need to argue with any of you. I think every adult has lived that at some point in their life. But Todd McNair didn't want to do that. You see, Coach McNair when you break it down, he's not asking for fair treatment. He's asking for special treatment. He doesn't want to call people. He doesn't want to send applications. He wants the job to come to him. And because he took that attitude, none of us can possibly know what would have happened if he actually broadly applied. Like dozens of other coaches have. Coaches who have moved on with their career even after a medical conduct finding. So to find that the NCAA caused his harm, you have to speculate as to what would have happened if he had tried more. And you're not allowed to do that. You kind of look at what he did and evaluate the evidence. And there's this destruction on mitigation of damages. Right. <clears throat> if he doesn't take effort, if he could have been back in coaching and could have been back earning a good salary and he didn't, whether it was a strategy for this trial or whatever other reason, then the NCAA isn't responsible for that damage. Because even if you think something unfair happens to you, you can't just quit. Under the law, you can't just quit. You've got to keep trying. And then we can assess, if you keep trying, what effort, what fruit those efforts yield, and whether you were actually injured. But if you don't try, you don't get to ask for damage. Coach McNair, you know, I know at times in, in, in that day that, that I was examining him, he fought me on some things, I fought him on some things, but on this, he did not fight at all. Coach McNair, you knew if you tried too hard to get a job, you couldn't come into this court and claim that this was a career and extension. He said, yep, that's fair. My question was, when you claim in this lawsuit, which he filed shortly after the appeal, filed it back in 2011, when you claim in this lawsuit that your career had been ended by the NCA, you had no possible support for that because you had not even applied for a single job. Answer, okay, yes. You can't speculate. None of us know what coach, what would have happened to Coach McNair if he had hit the ground running and moved on with his career. And because he didn't, because he declared his career to be over before he had put in a single application or even picked up the phone, we're left to speculate. And speculation is an evidence. You can't answer yes on any of these very questions based on speculation. And so, Folks, if I've, if I've done my job even a third of the way well, as I should, I should never get the questioning. But if you do, you're going to find another question where there's just about no evidence at all. Actually, I take it back. There is no evidence at all. Dr. Vermoos is, is their expert on economic damage. And those are the damages that are about salary, lost income going back in time, lost earning capacity going forward in time. But Dr. Formuzis was just fed a bunch of assumptions. Well, if the assumptions are good, we don't have a problem with his calculations. He's good at what he does. The problem is the assumptions are pulled out of thin air. He didn't care whether they were right or wrong. He figured Evidence would be in the case to prove them, but there isn't. And he agreed, of course, you need to care about those assumptions. 
you can't award one red cent unless you find those assumptions are true. And again, look at the jury instructions because the law lays it out. In determining the weight to give to the expert's opinion that is based on the assumed facts, you should consider whether the assumed facts are true. If I ask someone to assume the Earth is flat and run a bunch of calculations, that's not very useful if the Earth is flat. <coughs> Here are the assumptions. He assumed that without the NCA report, Coach McNair would have stayed at a Power 5 school for the next 19 years. There's no evidence of that, just none. He assumed that Coach McNair now can't get a college coaching job. There's no evidence of that. Over eight years, he reached out to one college. He affirmatively reached out to one college out of over 600 that played football. That's University of Washington. And two schools reached out to him. So even if we throw those in, that's three out of 670. Does that make sense? To say, well, I've talked to three out of 670, it didn't work out, so must be that I can't get a job with any of them. And there's absolutely no evidence that this was a career ending penalty. There's 32 NFL teams, there's 671 college football teams. And over eight years, Coach McNair contacted a grand total of three, and a grand total of three contacted him. And here's the thing, two teams that he reached out to in the NFL, the Cardinals and the Seahawks. Well, the Seahawks didn't call him back, the Cardinals reached out to him, and he came close to getting a job. He flew out there, met with the owner and everything. But what did their expert admit? That other coaches with unethical conduct findings had gotten work at both of these teams. The same thing that Coach McNair has in his background, other coaches had and they got work. So what reason is there to assume that that's what prevented him? And of course, we know there is something else. And this is the dog issue, and I don't want to belabor it. I don't want to make it personal. But we know there's news articles about it that Coach McNair is bothered by, although he never sued the news publications. We know that even though it's from 93 and 96, it came up 20 years later with the Cardinals. So think about that. Cardinals didn't just ask him about the NCAA issue. The president of the Cardinals asked him about the dog issue as well. And then he didn't get the job. And we know the Cardinals have given other jobs to people with NCAA issues. And Temple, the straw that broke the camel's back, when he didn't get that one, he had attorneys reach out about the dog issue and not the NCAA. So again, you can't just jump to the conclusion that it's because of these reports. And maybe the biggest distraction here, they talk about the SEC, because the SEC has a rule that if you're going to hire a coach with an unethical conduct finding, you've got to go through some extra steps. Well, other coaches have been hired with unethical conduct findings in the SEC, but all you need to know is that he never applied to an SEC school. So how can he say that that's the reason he didn't get a job that he didn't even apply for? And he said his Ed Orgeron, who's at LSU and the SEC, is not, he's not a fan of it. He didn't reach out to Ed Orgeron because he doesn't want to work with him, not because of the SEC. And Lane Kiffin worked for a time at the SEC, but McNair didn't reach out to him. And Kiffin's now moved on out of the SEC, and McNair still hasn't reached out to him. So the SEC is a distraction. And here's the thing about evidence and damages. You need the former for the latter. You need evidence to find damages. And here are a couple of really important things in the instructions. This is on pages 21 and 22 of the package. You must not speculate or guess in awarding damages. Arguments of counsel are not evidence of damages. You have to look at testimony of witnesses and the other evidence. What evidence? What evidence of damages? And let me here focus, because I've talked so far mostly about the economic side, but let me talk about the non-economic side. You know, what counsel calls the human damages. Well, those are, those are a real kind of damages. I'm not dismissing those. But these rules still apply. 
You don't say, oh, well, he's a human, and these are human damages, so let's pick out out of our pocket $27 million. You can't speculate or guess. If you need to speculate or guess to put a dollar sign in that, the dollar amount is the only dollar amount you can put in zero. Because nothing can prove it to you. Now, this is the grand sum total of the evidence of the non-economic damages in this case. I did it on one slide. Coach McNair told us that he started drinking and he went into a depression in 2012, and that for a while, he was on the couch, he wouldn't get off the couch. Now, I'm not questioning that. I'm certainly not mocking it. But this is the sum total of the evidence. How are you gonna get from that to 27 million without speculating or guessing? Why not? Without argument, Council, which is not evidence of damages, how do you put a figure on that? They've given you nothing. They are literally asking you to pluck a number out of the air, a number in the millions, pluck it out of the air and plop it down in the verdict form, and you can't do that. I understand that human damages are not a science. I understand that it's not about salary, but you can put some things on. You can talk about, here's how I was depressed, here's what my counselor said, Here's what happened. Here's what I did. None of that. He told you twice, two sentences, $27 million for two sentences. How do you measure that? And then the last question, and if I've done a tenth of the job I should be doing, you will not get to this question. This is punitive damages, because $27 million ain't enough. They want more. And in order to get more, they've got to get you to answer this question, that Todd McNair proved by clear and convincing evidence, that's that higher burden, that the NCA acted with malice, oppression, or fraud. Folks, they should be embarrassed when they're asking for this. All those definitions are about despicable conduct. The worst of the worst. Really? He had five years of process. I'm not saying there were no mistakes. I'm not saying everything was perfect. But vile, base, or contemptible that was looked down on and despised by reasonable people. Most of what they're complaining about you heard was normal. The NCA can't compel third party witnesses. They can't say, Lloyd Lake, come talk to us right now. Lloyd Lake, you gotta answer USC's questions. That's just outside their power. And those aren't rules they make. Those are rules that are made by the member institutions. You heard that appellate coordinators do advise the committee. They don't actively participate in deliberations, but they tell them what they think. You have heard in other cases that observers were invited to speak. And you hear that in every case they keep talking, the voting members, until they decide and arrive on a consensus. And if we're talking about punitive damages, then who's your villain? These are the speakers of the first state. Are any of them despicable? Is their conduct despicable? These are the speakers of the second state, the appeals report. Are anything despicable about them? <coughs> Mark Emmer wasn't even involved in the decision of this case. He gives one innocuous answer in a question about timing of NCA investigations by mentioning the Reggie Bush case and says, they got it right, I think. That makes it despicable. And you know that the NCAA has taken responsibility. We haven't run from the mistakes in the investigation in the last operations. That's why Todd McNair had to have another chance to explain at the hearing. We haven't run from the side emails, but they're side emails. They didn't go to the people who matter. And we have not run from Chef Cooper. He wrote a nasty email, and he suffered a serious consequence. But what about Coach McNair and his responsibility to protect Bush from unscrupulous agents, to tell the truth, whether it's to staff or the hearing or here in court? 
Well, what about the basic responsibility that all of us have to move on with our careers? And here's the Chef Cooper email. I'm not hiding from it. He was way out of line when he wrote this. And even though it only went to Rod up hop, that doesn't excuse it. I'm not defending it. I'm a defense counsel, but I'm not defending it. Neither is the NCAA. Emmert said it was ill-advised and inappropriate, and Cooper was replaced by a different leader. He was demoted. So that gets us through the verdict form. but there's some things I want to say that apply to all the questions and apply to why Coach McNair can't satisfy his burden of proof. There's an instruction about a party that has the power to produce better evidence. A party could have shown you better evidence and didn't. You can distrust the weaker evidence. Now for the NCAA, we brought and we showed you our people. Brought those who could come live and those who couldn't were on TV. We didn't hide Chef Cooper, we didn't hide Roscoe Howard, we didn't hide Rod Alpoff. <coughs> Todd McNair and his team have decided to rest their entire case on the words of Todd McNair, who has 27 million reasons to try to spin things. They didn't call a single witness to support his testimony. They didn't call a single human being from the state of California live into this court to support it. And they didn't call a single human being in the United States of America on deposition to support it. Yet they want you to believe that all these people have something to say that backs him up. They say, oh, Reggie said to the NCAA that Todd McNair didn't know about this. They didn't call Reggie Bush to tell you that. Now, I'll give him a break on Reggie because Reggie also told the NCAA the benefits never happened, so nobody believes Reggie, so I, I'm not going to fault them for not calling for Reggie, but, but if he had something to say that helped Todd McNair, they could have called him instead of just making it McNair say so. What about Faison Love, the friend? Todd McNair told the committee, oh, Faison Love is a friend of mine, but he told me Lake wasn't an agent. Well, if his good friend Faison had something good to say, it's interesting that we never heard from him. Pete Carroll. Coach Carroll, why didn't you give Todd McNair a job in Seattle? Isn't that a question you'd like to answer? Because they want you to assume that it's because of this, but they chose not to call him. Or Lane Kiffin. They want you to say Lane Kiffin decided to keep Todd McNair and told the report. Lane Kiffin's alive and well. They could have deposed him and gotten that on the record. Instead, they just want you to take McNair's word for it. <coughs> they say Matt Rule wanted to give him a job at Temple. He's alive and well. They chose not to question him about anything. They say Bruce Arians wanted to hire him, and this all went down in Arizona, and they want you to believe it's because of the NCAA. Could have called Bruce Arians. Could have called the Cardinals president, Michael Bidwell. Could have called Steve, Michael Bidwell, who asked him about the dog issue. Maybe that's why they didn't want to call him. They could have called Steve Sarkeesian at University of Washington, Ed Orgeron at LSU, Nick Holt at Western Kentucky, Todd Bowles at the New York Jets. Instead, they, it's all just what Todd McNair says. So. And this is the this is the kicker. They say USC wanted to keep Todd McNair but had to change its mind after the committee report. Folks. We're less than a mile from the USC campus. You've probably walked further for lunch during this trial than Todd McNair and his attorneys would have to walk to their ways from the USC. They chose not to present you the better evidence to give you just Todd McNair say so. And you should apply your common sense and ask yourself why. And here's one more person. Now, they complain bitterly in this case that Todd McNair and his lawyers and USC and their lawyers were not allowed in the NCAA interview of Lloyd Lake. And in the NCAA rules, that's the way it is. If Lloyd Lake puts that restriction on, the staff can't make him change or take that down. But you heard time after time counsel asked, 
about the power of cross-examining Lloyd Lake. If only they could cross-examine Lloyd Lake, this whole story would fall apart. Cross-examination, the most powerful engine ever developed for the discovery of truth, counsel asked Joe Petuto. So important to our system <coughs> that a lawyer has a right to cross-examine. He argued that to you, too. Well, folks, they don't believe that argument because they've had seven years to cross-examine. Couldn't do it in the NCAA, but once they filed a lawsuit, they could have deposed them just like everyone else. They could have gotten him down from San Diego and subpoenaed him to come live. They don't want to cross-examine Lloyd Lake because they know it's not <coughs> their case. And it's not going to help their burden of proof. <coughs> so, in our system, and I'm getting very close to the end here. In our system, plaintiff goes first and plaintiff goes last. And that's because plaintiff has the burden. So when I finish talking here, you're not going to hear from me again. And if counsel has something more to tell you, I don't have a chance to react. But I think we know what you're going to hear from counsel. You're going to hear these same sound bites. Botched interview. Recklessly constructed records, factually enacted, morally banked, influenced the committee. And you're going to hear him vouch for Todd McNair and denigrate every other witness in the case. What you won't hear is real evidence of motive. I'm not talking about misinterpreting one sentence in a Dennis Thomas deposition. I'm talking about real evidence that this had anything to do with the U.S. Or e evidence that any one of these committees disagreed. They want to make it seem like it was going to go for McNair until the bad guys got involved. No one told you that. Everyone said nobody believed McNair, but they still needed to be careful about it. And some people needed more time to say, even though I don't believe him, I want to talk more before I can make up. There's no evidence that the mistakes in the questions matter. There's no evidence proving any of their assumptions about this being a career ender. And there's no evidence of damages. Now, counsel quoted Bob Dylan. Don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. It's from 1965. We're not at a concert here. We're in a court of law. And you do need evidence before you get a dollar or 27 million of them from someone. They don't have the evidence. They don't have the goods. What they're doing, really, is just blowing up the wind. Because they can't prove it. Now, when I was up here for opening, I ended by asking you to consider three questions. These are not verdict form questions. These are not elements. But they frame the case. Did McNair tell the truth to the committee? or for that matter, to the staff, or for that matter, here in court. Was the story consistent or did it change? Did the committee end McNair's coaching career? And did Mr. McNair live up to his own responsibilities? <coughs> and folks, the answer to those questions is no. No, he didn't tell the truth. No, they didn't end his career. And no, he didn't live up to his responsibilities. To Reggie Bush, to the NCAA or ultimately to himself and his family. Now, plaintiffs have appealed. Go back. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about Coach McNair. For obvious reasons, he's the center of this whole story. I don't know what you think of him. Some of you may feel sympathy. Some of you may dislike something you heard. My argument doesn't depend on how you feel about Todd. I'm not asking you to dislike him. I'm just asking you to hold him. And I'm not asking you to make assumptions. I'm not asking you to speculate 
Yes. I'm not trying to get a rise out of your emotions by talking about how the NCA hung and tied right there. All I'm asking you on behalf of my client, my client who's been here and whose people have been here every day of trial, all I'm asking you is to take the law the judge gives you and apply it to the action. If you do that, <coughs> if you do that, you should return for the NCAA. Because the NCAA is not responsible for Coach McNair's own choices. The choices he made in 2005 and 2006 when he was talking to the late. The choices he made in the first interview, and then the second interview, and then the first hearing, and then the second hearing. And the choices he made in the last eight years where he decided before ever giving it a chance that this was for him. I want to thank you for the time you've taken. I want to thank you for sitting here and listening to us go on and on. I want all of you to give the case careful consideration and listen to each other. <coughs> 